This is uh, this is this is actually the name of the battle in Confederate terms. They they didn't call it the Battle of Pea Ridge. They called it the Battle of Elkhorn Tavern. The Battle of Pea Ridge was the was the Union name for this battle. And there is um, that that structure in the background is the Elkhorn Tavern, which has been rebuilt. It, it's burned down at least once and been rebuilt, and it looks just like that on the on the battleground. Let's move to the to the battle. This is the military park that's set up there. It's a beautiful park. If you've never been there, it's, it is a it's a striking uh, uh, memorial to this battle. It, uh, the gun they have cannons all over the place, but uh, uh, this this represents essentially the entire arena of the battle of Pea Ridge. Uh, it's uh, in I'll bring, bring up the part of Arkansas that it's in. Uh, if you see in the top of the map there, you'll see the name Pea Ridge. What that is is a rock formation that runs for, oh, I don't know, maybe five miles or so. And it's, it's very rugged. As a matter of fact, it, it, the, in the prosecution of the battle, the, the forces had to split around it. They could not bring themselves to bear. In the first place, uh, the, the way it was set up, set up that, let me go to the battle in a minute. I want to give a little bit of background on, on the whole campaign and everything that, that led up to this battle. Um, this is the Trans-Mississippi Theater. Can you see this? Yeah. Okay. Yes. You see St. Louis up in the upper right? And, and that, the gray area in the middle is what was considered the Trans-Mississippi region, meaning across the Mississippi. And the reason why this is such a, well, I mean, was such an important area of of, of activity. Now, again, let's, let's look at the, the background of the battle on, and, and the, 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 exactly what the situation was uh, around that region. Is that this is like around one year into the war. Uh, everything was in flux all over the south of, of the setting up the blockade and all these things that were going on to prosecute the war. But uh, or to, to just get the wars going and all of these entities that were coming into the war, and a lot of them had to decide whether they were going to even be in the war, such as Texas. Texas had a tremendous debate as to whether it is even going to come into the war. Sam Houston was absolutely against secession. He would prefer to have gone back to a republic rather than secede from the Union. And so there's all of these issues are going on, and Lincoln is focusing on, you had 11 states that went out that seceded, and then his first one, his greatest uh, objectives at this point of the war is to save the states that were actually slave states that had not seceded, Missouri being one of them, and Missouri being a very important state because it held a great deal of influence over the Mississippi River, which was going to be a lifeline in, in the whole war, and uh, Lincoln knew that he had to maintain control of the Mississippi River, or he wouldn't be able to win the war, because it just, it's too much of a lifeline to the whole western part of the United States. So, uh, his, his, one of his early determinations was to bring about control of, uh, of Missouri, maintaining it in the Union, and you have a large contingent. The governor was, ultimately became a secessionist. Uh, Jackson, and uh, he basically was in allegiance with this, uh, there were a lot of mistakes, a lot of uh, personalities got in the way of everything at, at this time of the war. And nobody had settled down to how this war was going to be prosecuted until it was about the early part of 1862. Now, another thing that maybe you all might not know is that this very day, 151 years ago, they were cleaning their dead off of the field at Battle Pea Ridge. March the 7th, 1872, was actually the main battle day of the of that of the Battle of Pea Ridge. And uh, the uh, and anyway, we'll, we'll move to the battle stuff in a minute. But you can see the things that were going on. The Confederates had beaten General Lyon at Wilson's Creek. <coughs> about three months before, uh, no, five months before, at least in October. In October of 1861, 
uh, General Lyon was <coughs> making a march south to to try to maintain uh, the Union control over Missouri, and McCulloch, Ben McCulloch and Price, a, a, a general from Missouri, came together and defeated utterly and ran the Yankees back up to Rolla at the Battle of Wilson's Creek. The only thing is, is they didn't pursue at that point. And anyway, so that left Missouri still in flux militarily. And but the rest of this whole area here is got to be somehow brought under control. They've got to take the, the Union forces have to take the, the Confederacy out of the of the equation, at least militarily in this part of the country. And so that's this is like the background. Another thing that I want to that, let's move on to the next slide here. Okay. Here, here are the generals at Pea Ridge. The two, the, the bigger the general was, the more important he was to the side. The Union general was uh, Samuel Curtis, and uh, the Confederate general was uh, Earl Van Doren. Now, Ben McCulloch should have been the overall commander, but the problem with McCulloch is that he and Price, I wish I had a pointer, this is Price, the is Sterling, guy Sterling, Sterling Price. Sterling Price. He was the Missouri commander. He was West Point trained. He thought that he was supposed to run the show because they were defending. And so he and and uh, McCulloch, who's the, the guy in the very back between Curtis and uh, Van Dorn, uh, these guys were, had a horrible feud. They hated each other. They, they resented each other's position. They were jealous of each other. They they fought uh, openly, feuded, and in, after in after the Battle of, of um, Wilson's Creek, they didn't attack and pr pursue Lyon because uh, uh, McCulloch didn't trust the Missourians, and Price resented McCulloch. They broke up, went back south, gathered up around Fayetteville, Arkansas, and. So Lyon got away. They didn't pursue to defeat the Union Army at that time. And of course, they, they fell back to more secure lines. But if the, if the, if the Confederate Army had pursued them, they could, have, they could have gone on and attacked St. Louis at that point. But they had to, they had to conquer St. Louis, or they weren't going to win Missouri. Anyway, that's the basis of it. Then, you over here on the left, you have Albert Pike, who was in charge of the Cher Cherokees. And over on the far right, is uh, Franz Siegel. You know, Franz Siegel was the leader of the German contingent in, in uh, Curtis's Union Army. He was a German immigrant, and most of his volunteers were German immigrants. They didn't even speak English. <coughs> and they came into the war, and it's been well documented that the, the German immigrants were far and away more uh, sympathetic to the Union cause. Uh, they had come for the values that they saw in, in, the, in the Union philosophy or the, the uh, Northern philosophy of industry and, and uh, uh, anyway, not going into all those details. He, he was the leader of that group. And it's ironic. Well, somebody remind me to tell you Siegel's outcome <laughs> a little bit later on because I want to go in and get into the battle itself. Um, those are, those are two maps that we will see in, in a larger format. This is March the 6th. This was a situation. Curtis had brought down this army, a very well-organized army of, of 10,500. About a third of them were German immigrants under uh, uh, <coughs> Siegel, Franz Siegel, and the rest of them were under different commanders and different organizations, but that was the nature of his force. But you can see where he set up down here in the blue lines, he said, well, he was assuming that he was going to see the Confederate forces whenever he saw them, where they were going to come up from the south and cross Little Sugar Creek. And so he was set up on the, the, on the, on the, the, the high ground above the creek. And uh, what you see uh, uh, coming across the, what they call the Bentonville Detour, which is still, if you looked on, if you can see on the map of the, of the, of the park, it's still a, a road there today. The, the Bentonville Detour. And um, you see the 12 Corners Church up there? That church is still there. 
I've been to about six weddings at that church. All the kids from Peter Ridge High School, they all get married at, at the 12, uh, 12 Corner Church. It's like a, it's not a functioning church, it's just a church that's there, and it's kind of cool to go have their weddings there. Anyway, I've been to a bunch of them. He's still there. Anyway, so what happens is that Van Doren, he has taken over control of his army because McCulloch and, P and Price cannot get along. They, are, they have become bitter enemies. They cannot cooperate directly, so they have to have somebody con, uh, you know, commanding them. And that's the reason that Earl Van Doren is there. The problem is, is he's, not, he's, he's got some character flaws. <laughs> and so he's not the best commander to, to command two strong-minded generals. And, <clears throat> and the other thing is he's... And this is something that I learned at the battleground. I haven't even seen it as I've re reviewed the reading I, that I uh, had to read to catch up. I hadn't taught this in 20 years. <laughs> anyway, he was he was violently ill during this whole campaign. He had a, a, a acute attack of dysentery, and he had to be carried on a litter. Uh, uh, much of the time he needed to be moved around, he had to be carried because he was a, so weak and debilitated from this uh, from this attack of dysentery, and uh, and it kept him from keeping focus on everything. If you've ever had that problem, you know it's hard to keep everything straight in your mind. Anyway, it was actually it turned out that he was probably the biggest factor because another unique thing is this was one of the only battles in the whole history of the Civil War where the, the, the South, the, the Confederate forces, outnumbered the, the Union forces. We outnumbered the, the, the combined forces of Price and McCulloch were over 16,000 men, and that, that including the Cherokees. But the Cherokees numbered less than 1,000, but nevertheless, it was still a significant group. Anyway, uh, they, they outnumbered the, 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 uh, the Union. However, the Union had the latest armaments. They had, they had experienced um, uh, cannoneers, if you will. They had howitzers. They had everything that they that could give them the best fighting that they, they could have. So when, uh, when, when they were attacked, they, they concentrated their fire. Whenever they came in, into, into contact, they concentrated their fire on knocking out the, the Confederate uh, cannons. The, and so by the, end of the sec, by the end of the seventh, the Confederacy had very little cannon to bring to bear on. on and the cannon made a lot of difference when, it, when, when you do the cannonading and then you attack by infantry. And if the infantry is out there exposed to this incredible uh, canister and all that, and they were, the, the, the Union was well armed. Anyway, but nevertheless, the, the force of numbers is going to make a lot of difference. And uh, so on the night of the 6th, uh, Earl Van Dorn, his, his uh, whole uh, strategy was to catch them by surprise on their flank, which he did. The thing is, is he had marched these people like for three solid days to get in place three days, and this is a horrendous snowstorm going on. This is, I mean, if anybody's ever been in the I live there, we can, you can get some very, very bad winter weather there. And they had as bad a winter weather as you could get. And they were marching on the, on the, you know, through the night, forced march for three days. They only had three days of rations. Each man, when this, when this whole, uh, process began from probably Fayetteville or thereabouts. When they were marching up, they they went around through Bentonville and they came across country. And from Bentonville to this area is not two mountains. I mean, it's just rolling hills. These are actually some of the first mountains you come to when you call them mountains. I mean, this is the Ozarks. They're not real huge mountains. And you see what they call big mountain. But right, really, in, in reality, that's really what people consider to be Pea Ridge. What you see up there is a big mountain. That's Pea Ridge. And, uh, and so when they got there on the night of the 6th, they're worn out, they're hungry, and they, they and Van Doren, you see where he is up at the top of the map, he moves into that position and then splits his force. Price on the right, and McCulloch, and Pike with the Cherokees on the left. Now, 
fight under, under McCulloch, you have McIntosh, who's another able commander. I don't know where he's from, but he, he was considered to be a very able commander. Okay, so they began their attack on the Union position like at dawn, <clears throat> maybe before dawn. They're moving in position and they attack. But they haven't been there long enough to get a real good feel for the, for the, for the field of action. And so when they attack, Okay, first they attack, uh, this, the, the left side over here is called Lee Town, the right side is called Elkhorn Tavern. That's just the names of the two fronts on the, in this battle. Now you see that, that uh, Curtis is set up here all, along the street, but he's got, he's, all he has to do is turn his, everything around and head back through the trees. All of this is very, all of this is very wooded. This is, this is open pasture, basically. This is all extremely wooded, so the Union is hiding behind the trees, basically, and I mean, in their formations. And they got their, their cannon positioned to uh, strike out. Let's, let's go look at, uh, at the March the 7th. Okay, so here Curtis starts driving on Lee Town with um, Osterhaus and some of his other colonels and whatnot are headed towards Lee Town, which is this open pasture area, and Price is coming around now. You see, it, they're not coming at the same time. This is another problem that the, the Confederates have to do. McCulloch is coming through with his people uh, at the very beginning of the day. It's about three hours later before Price starts putting pressure on this, uh, let's call it the right flank over there. Anyway, so, McCulloch is moving through as they drive these people back into the woods. Uh, they, they drive the Union forces back into the woods at Lee Town. And they, they basically broke and just scattered back into the trees to reform, to regroup. And so McCulloch, he's one of these daring, extremely brave, valiant knights in shining armor kind of thing. He didn't have shiny armor, he didn't have dress. He dressed down. He didn't dress up. <laughs> He'd been a Texas Ranger. I'm sorry? He'd been a Texas Ranger. He, well. Yeah, for many years. And an Indian fighter. And the guy, he related to his troops. His troops related to him. They revered him. He was one of the most popular commanders in the early part of the war anywhere because his, his men were just absolutely devoted to him. And whatever he said, bam, they just went to do it. Okay. He goes, he decides he's got to go see what's going on because he doesn't know this place. He only is, so he rides through his troop to get up and get a good view of it, and he got killed, shot through the heart by a Union sniper at like 9.30 in the morning. Now this is after they routed the, the, this left flank over this left side of the battlefield. They routed the Yankee uh, uh, infantry and everything. They were pouring back into the and he goes up to see what's going on, he got killed. Dead. Okay. They inform McIntosh that McCullough's killed, meaning he knows that he's in charge now. And so he leads a charge to go recover McCullough's body, and he got nailed. Within minutes, he got killed. McIntosh. This is McCulloch's second in command. A bear over here on the right, he uh, he didn't even know that McCulloch got killed which was making him now the, the lead Confederate commander. He doesn't know it. And so he finds a hole to charge through the Union lines, and he winds up going too far and getting surrounded, and he got captured. So Hebert, McIntosh, and McCulloch are out of the action, and the Confederates have no leadership. They don't know what to do because what? They've been marching all night to get there just to get started, and then there's nobody there to tell them where to go, what to do, how to pr proceed. And so they just basically fall back in confusion. And the Yankees are beat up really bad, so they don't pursue them at that point. They just turn around and head back up towards the backside of Pea Ridge. And eventually they're going to link up with the rest of the troops over there. Meanwhile, about this time is when Price becomes, comes into action. Well, by the time Price comes into action, and he is making big inroads, I mean, he just pushes them all the way back down to 
let's, let's go over and look at the, the Battle of, that's Lee Town. This is another picture of it. I was going to go into this, but it's so complicated it's hard to see what's going on, so we won't worry about it. Here's the Battle of Elk Horn Tavern. And over here you've got Price with all of his people, and they push down, and if you can see these dotted blue lines, that's the retreat of the Union forces. So Price is actually moving the, the Union army out and pushing them back down into the, uh, the lower part of this area here. But you can see all those dotted lines. That's the Union retreating, because when Price actually gets things moving, he just sweeps them out of the way, and they back up, and Carr, regroups and he finds these troops that have been relieved from what was going on at Leetown, they come up and they stop the Confederate advance. And so at this point, by this time, day is starting to decline and, and these, these forces are you know, scattered and, and mixed up and everything and so it's time to regroup. And so as they, as they pull back at the end of the of, uh, March the 7th, the, the South is still basically won the field. They routed them in Lee Town, they routed them at Elkhorn Tavern, and they, they, uh, uh, they, they need to regroup now to make that final push to finish them off the next day, which would be March the 8th. And everybody's anticipating <laughs> what happened, okay. Well, this is what happened, okay. <laughs> On March the 8th, Van Dorn suddenly realizes that he's lost his supply train. Through his own neglect, he didn't coordinate right. Another thing that you learn at the battleground when you get some of the more in the, the, the details of the story is that he had sorely offended the major or the colonel who was in charge of the supply train, and this guy took the supply train and went back to Bitcoin. <coughs> which is basically a day's march away. It's not that far. I mean, you can drive it in like 10 minutes, but <laughs> at that time, the wagon train with all of the supplies and ammunition. So essentially, he still has a, an army that is significantly larger than the Union Army. And the Union Army is battered, but they still have their cannon, their howitzers, their, their really top of the line ordnance, and the Confederates have been losing theirs like every time they shoot, they, they shoot, they, they blow up a, a Confederate caisson or a Confederate cannon and they don't have one to replace it, of course. Now, not only that, they are completely out of ammunition. These guys have been fighting for a whole day without rations. And so, basically what happens on the morning of the 8th, uh, Curtis attacks with his artillery and his ground forces and I can't remember which one of the of the of Van Doren's commanders goes in and faints as if the whole Confederate army is going to attack the, 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 the advancing Union forces while Van Doren sneaks his whole army down Huntsville Road and essentially escapes because if they would have gone up against this advancing Union forces, they would have been annihilated because they were out of ammunition, they had no more cannons, and so, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I thought I was going to remember this detail, but since his name is not on there, I can't remember which one it was, but one of the Confederate commanders fainted towards them, and they thought, and, and, he, and he drew them away, I think maybe, uh, I don't know whether it was up, the, up this, uh, up, to, up this north way, but anyway, Van Dorn took his whole army down the Huntsville Road and uh, essentially escaped because, I mean, he, he had the wherewithal and everything. It was just a lot of this thing was timing, it was personalities, and it was that early part of the war when people were still trying to figure out what they were going to do, what, you know, and, and in, a, in a war footing, before you have this whole strategy worked out, then you have a lot of things that can go on that have nothing to do with, with fighting. There's nothing wrong with the Confederate fighters. It was The problem was is they, they had been driven to exhaustion, and then when they have to go fight, they basically win the day. They won the seventh, but they woke up on the eighth defeated. 
because they discovered that they had no more ammunition, they had no food, and here was a, still a well-armed army attacking them with all this cannon fire that they had nothing to, work, to answer with. And then Nord made the only decision he could. At least he saved his army. But in the aftermath, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I wanted to tell you about the battle itself. No, it was, in, in a sense, it was a tragic <laughs> The South lost Ben McCulloch, who was an incredible charismatic leader. And, and McIntosh, he was considered to be a crackerjack of a, of a leader of men. And Abair, and Abair, you know, he was pensioned back to Louisiana. He was a, he led the Louisiana forces. Anyway, so basically the whole aftermath, and this kind of goes back to uh, the picture of the, of the trans Mississippi, let me see if I can, where is it? I'm a person. Okay, after this battle of Pea Ridge, uh, there was no, well, I, I think about, uh, uh, Sterling Price later in the war uh, tried to, what did I do? I don't know. Oh, we need to make there it a go. Go. Later in the war, in the 18th, early, uh, late 1863, Sterling Price tried to reestablish a force to, to, to attack St. Louis, but he uh, he was uh, stopped at Westport. He was actually driving on on Kansas City, and he his force attacked uh, Kansas City, and he was stopped at Westport. But he was trying to you know like flank St. Louis, and uh, uh, it didn't work out, and so that was basically his uh, last the last gasp of, of attacking and in, invading Missouri. Um, also, see, the, the, what happened when Van Dorn and his army retreated to uh, Fayetteville at first, maybe it went on down to Fort Smith, they were dispersed. At this point, there was a great demand for these western troops back in, in the eastern front. And so Van Dorn led, I think, about 10,000 men to Corinth. And Van Dorn was very unlucky. He didn't live but another six or eight months, he was killed climbing out of some colonel's wife's bedroom window. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it was a duel on the main street outside the hotel. He, he, was a, he was a dandy and, and a dandy with the women. And apparently, he offended some, uh, some actually a lower rank officer and who was actually but it was a duel. I don't know if they were talking about it. But anyway, uh, they, there was a new there was a new effort late in '62. I'm sorry when I said '60. Uh, Sorry, Christ tried to do that attack on St. Louis in 1864. Um, before the South, before the war completely went south for the South, he, he tried to take another stab, and he actually led something on the order of 11,000 troops up into Missouri, and they were going to sweep from. Western Missouri back around to St. Louis and it didn't work out. And he got defeated and, and dispersed out of Westport uh, up there up, uh, on the Missouri River. Anyway, uh, later in the end of 1862, <coughs> there was a, uh, another attempt to reorganize an army and they were they fought at the Battle of Prairie Grove. But again, a lot of these battles, in, in many cases, just came out as draws. But if the Union, if, if they did it, proceed or take over territory, it was for nothing. You know, they, they would fight and, and come to a draw and you know they'd count their dead and they were they were within ten uh, casualties of each other. And 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 if the if the Confederacy or the Southern forces couldn't take over any more Union territory, it, it, it came to nothing. And that's basically what happened in the West. Uh, and of course uh, then after after any organized actions took place, then the whole region began came under the, the, the renegades, the the uh, uh, deserters, the well deserters, and, and then the Quantrell kind of one of them would claim one of them would claim uh, uh, allegiance to the North, and another would claim they were just renegades. They were out there. Bushwhackers. Bushwhackers. Kill one everybody. Of them was Bush and what was the other one? Bloody Bill Anderson. I know, but Bushwhackers, and one side was the Bushwhackers, and the other side Red was the Red Legs. Was the what? Jayhawk. Red Legs. Red, Red Legs. 
The Yankees were the Redlegs. Yeah. Anyway, they, but they just they just ran roughshod over that region and uh, terrorized the people, stole their whatever they could from them, and uh, generate uh, uh, alienated the whole pocket. And most and up in up in that Ozark region, people just went and hid in valleys, just tried to stay out of out of out of sight. Yeah. But even if the casualties were roughly equal, the South had a much harder time getting replacements. Than the oh yeah, yeah. I mean, this was this was the, the attrition thing was what killed them in the long run. Was the fact that every time you killed after 1863, every time you killed a Confederate, you couldn't replace him, and that's what you, that's what old Grant's main philosophy was. Any questions? Yes. Yes. I'm from a different camp, so it won't bring a bad name on this camp. <laughs> challenge a few of your little things, if I might. Just absolutely. Uh, are you broad-minded on I am very broad-minded. Absolutely. Okay, first of all, there's a little place we know as Texas that's in the Trans-Mississippi Theater. Absolutely, yes, sir. And uh, I was wondering why it's called Trans-Mississippi Theater when you only mean Missouri and a little part of Arkansas. Well, in any case, the, okay, uh, that's fine. Texas was a total entity unto itself. If you see down there, it is not in the gray. It is not considered to be trans-Mississippi in the sense of the action uh, that had direct bearing on the Mississippi. The trans-Mississippi is the region on the other side of Mississippi that was still connected to the Mississippi. Now, you, you may disagree. Well, with we you. were still under the flag and under General Richard Taylor, head of the Trans-Mississippi Department. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, all of our battles in and near Texas were in the Trans-Mississippi Department. But that's okay. what's no, I, I, I wouldn't argue that at all. I mean, I'm Secondly, of the 13 states that seceded, Missouri seceded uh, among the first few the first batch before Virginia finally seceded, mm -hmm. and uh, it was passed, the ordinance of session was passed by the legislature overwhelmingly, signed by its governor, uh, Sterling Price, who was governor. The next governor, by the way, was General Joe Shelby, CSA. He was the next legitimate elected governor of Missouri. But before him was General Sterling Price, who signed the ordinance of secession, and then it was put up to the voters, which went 75% for secession. <coughs> so Missouri was a Confederate state. Its flag was, its star was always on the Confederate flag. But, yeah. And uh, yes, they fought outside of Missouri most of the time. Uh, General Sterling Price was forced to, just as they fought outside of Kentucky, even though it seceded in 1862. They had to be the orphan divisions from Kentucky. Most Missourians had to fight outside of Missouri. All Northern Virginians had to fight outside of Northern Virginia. Uh, finally, Van Dorn was not shot getting out of a window. <laughs> he was shot according to both his two seconds uh -huh. and his opposing officer's two seconds in a proper duel carefully managed by his commanding officer in front of the hotel uh, in Tennessee where he died. But it was over a woman. Yes. And I defer to you on that absolutely. And I, it, it's just to me, it, it, I remember that the same story I don't know if y'all ever heard of Simon Bolivar, who was the liberator. He, 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 it was a great myth and legend that he yeah. got shot climbing out the window of a lover's. Well, he was One shot after he got out of the window. little yeah. thing that isn't contradicting you, it's yeah. just a point of interest. Yeah. Uh, the Cherokees, being all cotton planters in eastern uh, Indian territory, mm -hmm. of course, hadn't seen any Indian clothing for generations, they were 90% Scottish by that time. Their chief was Macintosh. Mm -hmm. And they had never seen a Cherokee costume. So they ordered it from a theatrical company in New York City, <laughs> which was New York home. City? Yes. <laughs> and what that company, being half owned by a gentleman named Abraham Lincoln, did was get a pass, as he gave all of his companies passes to trade between the lines, 
And uh, as long as he got his share. Okay, <laughs> since Mr. Lincoln gave the uh, permission for 5,000 uh, Lake Huron Indian uniforms to be made and to be shipped to the Cherokees so that they can fight in Indian costume, which they did. They did. <laughs> well, I, I, now, need, I need to cut this off. Yeah, I sorry, can, and we're going to thank you. Thank you, sir.